Hi, I'm Chris Rycroft, and welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In the previous two videos in this series, we introduced the singular value decomposition, a very useful technique in numerical linear algebra. Here, we're going to show that the singular value decomposition is closely related to principal component analysis, a widely used technique in statistics. We'll first look at the direct connection between these two techniques, and then we'll illustrate these techniques through an interesting example drawn from imaging. Let's first review principal component analysis through a simple example. I suppose we had a number of students who took two exams on math and English. Then we could arrange their scores on a 2D scatter plot where the math exam score will be on the horizontal axis and the English exam score will be on the vertical axis. And suppose that there was some correlation between the two score results for each student. Then we might find that our data points are aligned in a cloud along a diagonal line with some random variation. And given this form of the data, we could ask whether there are different axes that might better explain the correlations that we have. So one thing we could do is introduce one coordinate that is aligned with the primary variation in our data points. And then we could introduce a second coordinate that is orthogonal to that first one. And if we used those two axes, then we could describe that the first coordinate was roughly associated with academic aptitude. And the second coordinate was roughly associated with English specialization. And Given that the main variation is in the academic amplitude direction, then if we only wanted to store one number for each student, then we might store the academic aptitude number, because that would capture the majority of variation in this data set. Principal component analysis allows us to automatically find axes like this. And suppose that the math score is called x and the English score is called y then we would first construct the covariance matrix of x and y that we could call M. And that matrix M will be symmetric positive definite by construction. And therefore, we know that it has positive eigenvalues and the eigenvectors will be orthogonal. So we could define the eigenvalues to be lambda 1 greater than or equal to lambda 2 greater than or equal to lambda 3 and so on and corresponding eigenvectors v1, v2, v3, and so on. And we'll now look at a direct mathematical connection between this setup and the singular value decomposition. Let's now look at the connection between principal component analysis and the singular value decomposition. And we'll begin with the definition of the PCA covariance matrix. And let's introduce little m to be the total number of data points we have and we'll write x bar to be the mean of the x data and y bar to be the mean of the y data. And we can write our PCA covariance matrix with a factor of 1 over little m out front and then each of our variance and covariances can be written in terms of a sum. So the variance of x can be written using the sum from i equal 1 to m of xi minus x bar all squared and we have similar expressions for the covariance of x and y and the variance of y. So now let's introduce the following matrix A. And in the first column, we'll have the entries of x1 minus x bar, x2 minus x bar, down to x little m minus x bar. And in the second column, we'll have y1 minus y bar, y2 minus y bar, down to y little m minus y bar. And if we look at this matrix A, then we can see that there's a direct connection to the PCA covariance matrix. And the PCA covariance matrix can be written as 1 over little m multiplied by A transpose A. And this is a really useful connection. And if you recall from our discussion of the singular value decomposition, the singular values of a matrix A are the square roots of the eigenvalues of A transpose A. And furthermore, the left singular vectors of A are the eigenvectors of A transpose A. 
and this establishes now a direct mathematical connection between PCA and the SVD. In particular, if we look at the jth principal component, which will be the jth eigenvector of a PCA covariance matrix, then that will be equivalent to the jth left singular vector, which will be in the jth column of our matrix U in the SVD. Another important concept in PCA is to look at the variance that's explained by a particular principal component J, and we can also map this onto our singular value decomposition. And this will be given by the square of the jth singular value normalized by the sum of squares of all of the singular values. So we're now going to illustrate PCA using an example from imaging. And several years ago, I took a sequence of photos from my apartment in Central Square, which is around a 25 minute walk away from Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I took 73 frames in total. I set up my tripod to look down onto the street. And over the course of one afternoon and evening, I intermittently took a number of these photos. So I'm now going to play this movie for you. And you'll see that there are transitions in the lighting of the scene. And you'll also see that there are various people and cars on the street that come and go. So to begin with, everything is lit quite brightly. But shadows start to develop and pass over the street. And after some time, then we have this transition into nighttime. We see that the street becomes quite brightly illuminated from the street lighting. And we also see that various lights come on in the apartment blocks and houses. So each one of the frames of this movie can be thought of as a vector in high dimensional vector space. So we can take the red, green and blue color channel values at every pixel and assemble them into a long vector. And we'll now try and do PCA on this set of 73 images that we can think of in this vector space. And the first thing that we can look at is the mean image over all of these images. And that is what is shown here. If we look at the sky, then we see that it is rather smooth. This is because any small variations in clouds are averaged out over the duration of the movie. And we also see that the sky isn't particularly bright. And this makes sense because we're averaging the daytime images with the nighttime images as well, where the sky just appears black. If we look at the road in this mean image, then we see that there is some illumination of the road. And again, this is consistent because we are averaging some of those nighttime scenes where the road is brightly illuminated by the street lighting. So we'll now look at applying principal component analysis. And each one of these images is of size 1,866 by 1,397 pixels. And we'll first construct this matrix A, which will have 73 columns for each of our images. And each column will be of length 1,866 times 1,397 times 3. And that comes from the red, green, and blue color channels at each pixel. And if we look at the first column of A, we'll put the data from image one minus the mean image. And in the second column, we'll put the data from image two minus the mean image and so on. And throughout this example, we're going to index all of our matrices starting from one because this matches typical conventions for PCA. So to perform PCA, we're going to calculate the singular value decomposition of our matrix A. And in particular, we're going to look at the reduced SVD, which will give us all of the information that we require. So to begin, we're going to look at the spectrum of singular values that we have. And the first few singular values are on the order of several thousand. But then we see a fairly rapid decay and most of the singular values are on the order of 100. 
And one interesting thing to know here is that the 73rd singular value is actually equal to zero. And this is expected. Since we subtracted the mean image from all of the columns of A, that actually introduces a rank degeneracy into A. And that manifests here as having one zero singular value. Now let's connect this to principal component analysis. And if we want to look at the fraction of the total variance in component j, then we can calculate that as sigma j squared, our singular value squared, divided by the sum from i equal 1 to m of sigma i squared. So the sum of all of the singular values squared. And if we do that, then we end up with the following plot. And this is actually just equal to the previous plot, but with a rescaled vertical axis. And this plot makes it clear that the first few components contain the large fraction of the variance in the data set. In particular, the first component contains a very large fraction of the total variance. So we'll now look at how we can visualize the different principal components. And here I'm going to look at visualizing the first principal component. And this is actually a little bit tricky to do because if we look at the first principal component, then the various entries in this vector will be both positive and negative. And it's rather difficult to actually visualize a negative color. So to do this, I've split the component up into two images. And on the left panel, I'm showing all of the positive contributions in the component vector. And on the right panel, I'm showing all of the negative contributions. And I do that by taking the negative values and just flipping their sign. And if we look at this component, it actually makes a lot of sense that this explains the majority of the variance in our data set. In the positive part, we see that the street is strongly illuminated. And in the negative part, we see that the sky is brightly lit and some of the other buildings are lit. And now suppose that we took this first principal component and we added it to our mean image. Then because it has this positive contribution on the road illumination, it will make the road look quite brightly illuminated. And because it has this negative contribution in the sky, then that will actually subtract off the sky and we'll end up with a dark sky. So overall, that will give us an image that will look like nighttime. Now suppose that we took our mean image and we subtracted off some amount of this first principal component. Then that subtraction would remove any illumination of the street and it would brighten the sky and that would give us something that would look like a daytime image. And it's worth noting that the signs of the, the principal components don't matter. And we saw this when we looked at how the SVD was calculated. So here, the positive and negative contributions could easily be flipped around. And the variance in this component is about 80% of the total variance. And this makes sense because we know that this transition from daytime to nighttime is really the main thing that we see in the images. Let's now look at some of the higher principal components. So if we look at the second principal component, then we see that in the positive contribution, the gray house that's in the center of the frame is quite strongly lit. And in the negative contribution, we have a 
red orangey cast in the sky. And this component explains around 10% of the total variance. And in particular, when the shadows start to pass across the street, there are some periods where this grey house is quite brightly illuminated and this component can allow us to capture that illumination more accurately. If we now look at the third principal comp component, then in the positive contribution, we have a number of dusky colours that are kind of lighting up the street. In the negative contribution, we see that the buildings and apartment blocks are illuminated using yellow and greenish colours. And this component explains 3.18% of the total variance in the data set. If we look at the fourth principal component, then this explains 2.34% of the total variance. And we see in the positive contribution that the street is fairly brightly lit and there are also various shadows that are cast by the trees. And in particular, in the movie, we see that there is a period when the shadows move across the street and this component might help us to capture those shadow transitions more accurately. Once we get to the fifth principal component, then the amount of variance that they explain in the data is rather small. And here, the variance of this component is only 0.72% of the total. Often for these higher principal components, it becomes harder to ascribe meaning to what they represent, even though we can still make out the outlines of the various buildings and objects in the scene. Let's take a look at several more. The sixth component explains 0.62% of the total variance. The seventh component explains 0.39% of the total variance. And the eighth component explains 0.30% of the total variance. We can also use principal component analysis to analyze the progression of the movie frames. And on the horizontal axis here, I'm showing the frames J from 1 to 73, and I'm showing five curves corresponding to the first five principal components from k equal 1 to k equal 5. And for each component, I'm plotting the contribution that that component makes to the corresponding movie frame. And I can calculate that contribution in terms of sigma k multiplied by vkj, where here vkj is an element of the right singular matrix in the singular value decomposition. And if we look at these five curves here, we see that the largest transition happens in the first component, which goes from negative values before frame 50 to positive values after frame 60. And this makes sense because we know that that component is responsible for capturing the major transition from daytime to nighttime. And that therefore happens during this period from frame 50 to 60. Another thing that we noted is that the third component captures dusky colors on the street. And we can see that that component has a large contribution during this transition period from frame 50 to frame 60, which makes sense with it being used to capture the dusk effects in the movie frames. So these plots really connect to our conceptual understanding from daytime to dusk to night. And we could look at this in another way. So suppose that we plotted the trajectory of the movie in the space spanned by the first component and the second component. And if we did this, we would get the following line. And we could actually ascribe meanings to different parts of this plane here. So our daytime is on the left, our dusk period in the, is in the middle, and our nighttime is on the right. And one thing that I find really interesting about the singular value decomposition is even though it is a abstract numerical linear algebra technique, 
often what comes out of it can be interpreted conceptually. And so here we see that in this space that's been found by our numerical linear algebra technique, we're able to ascribe concepts to different regions. And because of this, principal component analysis and the SVD are really useful for exploratory data analysis, and they can be used to highlight various correlations and patterns in our data that we might not have seen otherwise. We can also use principal component analysis as a way to do image compression of our data set. And suppose we now return to our abstract representation of the vector space of our images. So we have this cloud of data points, and we know that we can calculate a mean image at some point in the center of this data point cloud. And we also now know that we can calculate this first principal component that gives us the direction that best explains the variance in our data points. And we saw that that actually explained the majority of variance in the data set, a full 80% of the total variance. So one way that we can actually compress the information in our data set is rather than represent each of these individual orange points, we could simply project them onto this one dimensional set from the mean along the direction of this first principal component. So if we do this projection, then we'll get a new set of points that are on this line. And that allows us to represent every frame in our movie with now a one component reconstruction we can write down each frame in terms of the mean image plus some contribution from our first principal component. So let's now take a look at the results of this. On the left here, I'm showing the original movie. And on the right here, I'm showing this one component reconstruction where we just take the mean image plus some contribution from our first principal component vector. And this is therefore retaining roughly 80% of the total variance in the original movie. Let me now play this movie. So we can definitely see that many things are missing in this movie on the right. We don't capture any of the shadows or people or cars. However, we do capture this major transition from daytime to nighttime. And if we were to stand far away, then these two sets of images would actually look rather rather similar to a first approximation. The one component reconstruction also represents an effective way to compress the data in the original movie. And to represent the one component reconstruction, we require the mean image, the first principal component, and then for each one of the 73 movie frames, we require the contribution of that first component. And overall, the amount of floating point numbers that we need to represent to do that is substantially less than representing each of the 73 original movie frames. So we can generalize this now to more components. And so here, I'm going to show the original movie again on the left. And now I'm going to show the three component reconstruction. So every image on the right here is made of the mean plus some contribution from those three most significant principal components. And together with those three components, we retain 93.05% of the total variance in the data set. So if you play this movie, then we can definitely see that more nuance is captured in the right frames. We see that more of the colors are captured correctly, although still many fine details such as cars and people are not visible. Let's now look at a six component reconstruction. And here, those six components contain 96.73% of the total variance in the data set. And so here, we can start to see that many small details are captured reasonably well. We can capture the shadows as they transition across the street 
and we can even see some hints of cars and people in various places. Finally, let's look at a 20 component reconstruction. And here we're retaining 98.79% of the total variance. And at this point, we can actually see many details. The shadows are captured very well. We can even see cars and people to some extent. So this is a really interesting technique that you can apply to data of this type. And if you're interested in looking at this in more detail, then check the description where I put links to the original movie files for all of these different reconstructions.